get over. Okay, so this is the book. This is the cover. Yay. Uh, let's. Um, and it's not just me, of course, today. So just really quickly around Zoom etiquette. Uh, for those of you who have not been on Zoom on a regular basis, uh, like many of us, um, and it not, may not yet be second nature for yourself, please keep yourself mute while the speaker is presenting. Um, as you can tell, uh, I cannot mute out, however, uh, the background noises of my family. So you will hear lots in the background. Hopefully it isn't distracting to all of you. If you do have a question or comment, I think I need to minimize the noise. If you do have a question or comment, please use the chat function or raise your hand. Um, and there's a way to do it. There's a participants. Uh, if you click on participants, you can raise your, your hand. So actually, let me just quickly mute myself and quickly remind the family. <laughs> uh, mama's in class right now. Just give me a second. Phone call. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> oh, see? Oh, unmuted it far too quickly. Uh, so, uh, again, try to keep yourself mute. I think there might be somebody who's on who might have forgotten to mute themselves. Um, I cannot, as I said, mute my, my child. That is impossible. Uh, hello? Hello? Nasan <laughs> hukayo? Um, can somebody, can you find it? Can, do you see it, uh, Wayne, where, where the, it's coming from? Because I think I have to, um, we may have to mute, uh, one of our guests. Um, okay. I think we're, uh, okay. So anyway, again, try to mute. All right. So let's just get started. Uh, so the book is about Filipino-American transnational and diasporic activism. Uh, so what it's about is really the fact that many Filipino-Americans, and we're talking about those who were born and or raised for a great majority of their lives in the United States. And so we're talking then kind of about people who are generally considered second generation or even 1.5. Uh, especially for those who might not have been born in the U.S. but were raised for a great majority of their lives in the United States. Uh, what the book really tracks is the ways that Filipino Americans um, forge and sustain multiple sets of connections, imaginative, so people think of these connections, um, you know, make, think of themselves as connected to the Philippines, emotional, these kinds of you know, feelings of attachment, cultural, and perhaps most significantly, and this is really the focus of the book, uh, they forge even political connections uh, with the Philippines. And okay, I need to pause for a second again, guys, because even I am being, I'm distracted by my own family. Give me a moment. So read that slide. And then Okay, uh, so again, what the book is about is this, this phenomenon of Filipinos who are uh, Filipino Americans forging these political kinds of connections to the Philippines. Um, so uh, what we found collectively, right, uh, and this is what's really striking about the contrib contributions of the book, is that you find that some Filipino Americans are engaged in political <laughs> projects uh, that aim at transforming both American and Philippine society simultaneously. Again, just to quickly pause, whoever is doesn't have their mute on, if it's okay, 
to please try to mute or if um, one of the other co-hosts might be able to help me um, so that we can kind of minimize as much background noise as possible. As it is, I'm distracted by my own house. Um, I can only imagine what it must be like for others if there are multiple kinds of inputs coming into our ears. But at any rate, um, the book is about how Filipino Americans are engaged in political projects, sometimes that are aimed simultaneously at transforming both American and Philippine society. And this in some ways is kind of captured, I think, very nicely in this San Francisco State University mural, where you sort of see um, important figures of Filipino America, uh, from, there, from Philip Veracruz, uh, for example, Al Robles. You see the struggles around the I Hotel, the Third World Liberation Front, and yet there's also kind of images that suggest kind of a connection to um, the Philippines and an engagement with issues in the Philippines. In other cases, that is, and this is found in, uh, by the contributors of the, of the book, you have Filipinos, Americans who espouse a politics that outright rejects conventional terms of belonging in the United States, and alternatively stake a claim of belonging in the Philippines, albeit a Philippines disentangled and ultimately severed from its neo-colonial roots. And what's, why I think it's really interesting, right? Again, we're talking about Filipino Americans, Filipinos who were born in the United States or those who've spent a great majority of their lives here. Now, um, we would expect, and it is documented by other scholars, um, numerous scholars, and the one in particular here um, that I find um, important and useful is uh, Faye Coronan. A Filipino study, uh, Faye Coronan argues that colonial mentality pervades Filipino American homes. And what that does is it results in stories framed by uh, US benevolent help. In other words, there are ways in which Filipinos have internalized a particular interpretation of the historical relations between the United States and the Philippines. And it's this U.S., uh, this in institutionalized history, which often characterizes the United States as savior to the Philippines, um, often framed in relation to collective memories of World War II, um, a war that, of course, was incredibly traumatic uh, for for Filipinos, a war also that occupies an especially important position in the United States national mythology of itself as the leader of the free world. As part of this institutional, uh, institutionalized history, the Philippine-American War is excised from this. Um, the institutionalized histories of Filipino America whether it's kind of these accounts of American ben benevolence or even this very dominant or hegemonic narrative of the U.S. as a nation of immigrants, that somehow the U.S. Um, is a place that over time immigrants can eventually kind of be incorporated and assimilated. These kinds of institutionalized histories, right, really frame much of our experience as uh, second generation Filipinos um, in the United States. And yet, right, and this is kind of where this book comes in and makes it's really, a, it's significant, a significant contribution, is though we inherit, and I, and I place myself here as a member of the Filipino, of, of a Filipino American um, second generation, and I'll um, speak too uh, just about my personal, um, my own engagement in a kind of diasporic politics. Though uh, Filipino Americans inherit institutionalized histories and colonial mentalities, Many U.S. born Filipinos, as well as those raised for most of their lives in the U.S., do not always see themselves as American. In fact, over the course of their lives, there is evidence that members of the immigrant second generation, and this is not necessarily a Filipinos only, but in some studies um, by social scientists who are really looking at the immigrant se second generation, um, there's evidence that suggests that um, Second generation uh, immigrants or those born to immigrants, those born and raised in the US but born to immigrant parents, tend to gravitate not toward mainstream identities but toward a more uh, quote unquote militant reaffirmation of the immigrant identity. And they find that this is also true uh, for Filipinos. Um, and, and this is something that this book really starts to um, shed light on. 
Now, um, in terms of uh, kind of this research on Filipino transnationalism, the work that you'll, you'll hear, as you hear from the different contributors of the volume, it really is that they're contributing um, some really new, new work that has yet to be done, that had yet to be done in the scholarship on Filipino transnationalism. So uh, the issue of Filipino transnationalism is transnationalism has actually been something um, that scholars have been studied for quite some time. So, uh, you know, there has been research that's really looked specifically at trans the transnational politics among Filipino uh, first generation immigrants, which I guess in some ways might be kind of understandable, right? People who've left the Philippines, made a life in the United States, may and do demonstrate a kind of continued connection to the Philippines in a whole range of ways, um, uh, whether it's uh, through remittance sending, um, through just actively being um, involved even in hometown associations, but even in terms of politics, right? There are many Filipino uh, immigrants who have, even after they've naturalized, become U.S. citizens, kind of reacquire their Philippine citizenship, may even try to participate in Philippine elections and et cetera. So some of this dynamic has been captured in um, some of the scholarship, but um, it's only really um, until recently that we've started to see more focus on the transnational uh, politics of U.S. born Filipinos. It's, but it really hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention. And this particular um, collection, The Time to Rise, is, is uh, not even quite a scholarly uh, piece of work. It's more um, a set of memoirs, as the title suggests. But we're starting to see more scholarship, and you'll see some of that even today, where people are actually trying to make sense of some of the transnational politics of U.S. born um, Filipinos. Uh, <laughs> and this picture of me. So part of what we're doing and what the big contribution uh, of this uh, book is, is that it's really about uh, this dynamic of next generations of the second generation, meaning to say, um, uh, not only does it collect scholarship of people who are trying to document um, kind of second generation activists, uh, we're looking at second generation, multiple cohorts, of second generation Filipino Americans over time who have been engaged in this sort of transnational and diasporic work. And, um, you know, because we haven't really started to see any of this kind of work in the scholarship. We haven't seen very much in terms of scholarly or even first person accounts of the activism of Filipino Americans born to post-1965 immigrants, people who are today, like myself, in their mid to, uh, to late 40s and younger. This work is still rather slim compared to some of the work on Filipino and uh, American anti-martial law activists, for example, um, people who... Um, who were really active in kind of diasporic politics in the 70s and into the 80s. So um, part of what this book does is it starts to kind of really make new inroads into the scholarship um, and is contributing to now growing collection of publications that suggest that post-1965 cohorts of second generation Filipino Americans, people, members of the Generation X or the millennial generation have investments in the homeland that are um, somewhat similar to, to to the baby bloomers of, of uh, the anti-martial law period. And so um, really this, this scholar, this uh, research is really trying to uh, build uh, in this new area. And, and it's exciting uh, because, you know, as you can see, and if you end up getting a chance to, uh, to read the volume on your own, and I'll talk a little bit about how uh, your libraries might be able to get uh, the book. But, um, you know, uh, we're dealing with, again, the ge multiple generations we're looking at uh, in the book, the second generation, we're looking at multiple um, cohorts of the second generation. And also, I have to say, you know, just a little bit of the backstory. Um, so, you know, I do have a picture of my 23 year old self here. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know which one it is, it's the one on the, the left with the short case. Can you see it? Can you see? Um, but uh, so part of my, you know, um, what's 
you know, I, I mean, I, I both approach this topic both as a scholar, but also somebody for whom this is also true, um, meaning that I myself, as a second generation uh, daughter of immigrants, found myself very much involved, um, drawn to and continue to be drawn to um, struggles for, for democracy in the Philippines, uh, really drawn to um, movements in the Philippines that are really trying to contest neoliberal globalization, really contest the lasting legacies of U.S. colonialism and imperialism in the Philippines. And so this is, um, for me, from a, a really great opportunity as a scholar to be able to um, to really um, gather new and up and coming generations of scholars together through this book. And mainly what's, what I find um, exciting about the collection is actually every single person I think who was invited to join this anthology um, was a graduate student or very, very um, early on in their careers as faculty members. And we actually all met, uh, we've all met, I think I have a relationship with every single one of them in some way, shape or form that's been forged over many years at different academic associations. And uh, really, um, this book is a direct uh, um, uh, outgrowth of convening of what was called Palimpsest II, a conference on Filipino studies that took place in 2016. So just so you see, it takes quite a bit of time between a time when you start talking about a book idea and when it actually comes out. So it took about three years. But um, Palimpsest II uh, took place at UC San Diego and the University of San Diego. And it was sort of a continuation of um, a first Palimpsest conference that really uh, was convening Filipino studies scholars uh, from throughout the country. And um, it was exciting because Palimpsest to really foregrounded up and coming young scholars. I was there in the audience listening to the presentations by um, nearly everybody who, beca who became a contributor to this book and really struck by how amazing the research was and really wanted to do what I could to leverage now um, my experience in the publishing world to try to get all of their um, work to print. So you'll see that we, the collection, and again, you only will be hearing from a, a fraction of the authors, the collection draws together scholars from a range of disciplines, including Asian American studies, history, American studies, women and gender studies, and sociology, and all, again, examining the transnational and diasporic identities of U.S.-born and U.S.-raised Filipinos, and especially focused on um, their transnational and, and diasporic politics. And it kind of brings us back to why I even started with uh, the film, uh, or not the film, but the video back home um, by Blue Scholars, because I think, again, it, it sort of reflects, and it reflects uh, sort of this um, so-called re militant reaffirmation of immigrant identity or this kind of diasporic orientation by Filipino Americans. And um, some of the scholarship actually in Filipino studies has been really paying attention to the cultural production of Filipino Americans, including um, artists like uh, Geologic specifically or the Blue Scholars that have been really noticing this this dynamic. Uh, so scholar Mark Villegas, who actually studies um, Filipino American hip hop, he actually argues that the song Back Home, uh, quote, not only condemns US militarization in contemporary contexts, but also um, comments on the longer legacy of American militarization in the Philippines. And you hear that in the lyrics of, of, the, of the song if you pay close attention. And so uh, according to Villegas, it expresses this kind of diasporic political sentiment. Again, you know, that's sort of a, um, a thread that we've been seeing in some of the Filipino studies scholarship where people are looking at um, artists, rappers, um, uh, poets, spoken word artists, uh, musicians, and the ways in which uh, uh, Filipino Americans uh, artists have these kinds of diasporic um, kind of e um, imaginaries and uh, these uh, express diasporic political sentiments. But what this book really does in a way that's really quite new um, is it's actually tracking the actual political engagements. What are people actually doing um, in, in terms of uh, engaging uh, around kind of homeland politics in the Philippines. So um, I do encourage you all, um, you know, because uh, I, um, 
none, we don't have enough uh, Filipino scholars in the academy. Uh, I thought that I had enough experience, but I didn't clearly um, didn't have sufficient experience to know that I could and should have probably negotiated better the price of the book. So unfortunately, the book um, is published with a press that tends to um, market primarily to libraries. So the book is actually costly. Um, it's about $100. And you know, I can tell you right now that if you bought the book, thank you, but I, none of us are getting any kind of um, compensation for that. It really is about the book publishing industry, and it's still a profit-making industry. Um, but, you know, I am happy to share at least uh, my contribution, and, and, and you might be able to get um, other individual uh, writers to share their specific contributions. But I do encourage you to, if you can, if you have connections with local libraries, to encourage your libraries at least to try to purchase it so that I can um, be available for broader consumption. Um, but again, you know, this is partly why, um, for example, we had to do the work that we do in the Blue Sun Center because we need to create um, our own autonomous um, uh, um, sites from which to kind of produce and publish work uh, so that we don't always have to necessarily be beholden to some of these other uh, kind of um, industry actors. Anyhow, I'll st end there. But again, that's really the quick, uh, um, broad overview of the book. And so now I want to go ahead and turn it over to the uh, presenters. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have each of the presenters uh, do about a 10 minute presentation. And and then open it up at the very end for Q&A, uh, as opposed to me stopping, taking your questions, and then going on just in the interest of time. And it's always hard to, to anticipate um, how time, how it will um, unfold. I just want to make sure that we give enough time to all of the folks who uh, contributed to chapter. And again, for those of you, um, as I introduce all of the contributors, if you guys don't mind introducing yourselves, as I said early on, what's exciting for all of you is lots of changes are happening for each of you. Uh, for the audience, again, I met um, everybody for the most part when they were still graduate students and many are no longer graduate students and are now um, making a great headway into academia. Um, so, uh, and things have been changing for them. Jobs have been accepted. Um, promotions have been happening. So I'm going to leave it to them to introduce themselves uh, as uh, we go along. So with that, I'm going to stop this and I will introduce our first speaker, Joy Salas. Joy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for inviting us to present your class. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Joy Salas. I am a postdoctoral, well, currently I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis, but in the fall, I'll start um, a new job. I'll be assistant professor of Asian American studies at Cal State LA. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm happy to announce that. That's the first time I publicly shared that with everybody. <laughs> um, so today, chapter, which is called, um, yes, it's called Bayanko, or My Dear Country, KDP and a Diasporic Vision of Filipino American Activism. And I focus on youth and student radicalism during the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos, who was in office from 1965 to 1986, and he declared martial law in 1972. And I use the, uh, the KDP, or Katapuna ng Mga Democratico Filipino, or Union of Democratic Filipinos, as my case study. KDP was a grassroots organization founded in 1973, and while Filipino Americans in previous eras, such as the cannery workers and Carlos Bulosan, built transnational connections with social movements in the Philippines, the Marcos era and the politics of the Cold War created the conditions for the formation of a radical diaspora consciousness among Filipino American youth. And I argue in my chapter that um, I take seriously the uh, KDP's intervention in Filipino American activism and their attempts to make the connections between local and homeland politics legible and possible in the Filipino community. So KDP was part of a new movement, a new uh, anti-dictatorship movement and a drastically changing diaspora. 
By the 1970s, the Filipino community had experienced new demographic and political shifts. Before World War II, World War II, Filipinos were U.S. nationals, not immigrants, as the Philippines was the largest overseas territory of the United States. After World War II, and most notably the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, thousands of Filipinos were able to migrate via their employers or family reunification. These waves of migration were also characterized by different politics, with many of the early migrant workers joining militant labor unions, while the second wave tended to be more conservative because it was uh, mainly comprised of veterans and war brides. And the post-1965 wave was seen as more politically mixed by activists and thus presented an opportune population for anti-Marcos activists to mobilize against the dictatorship. So KDP was an organization that was part of both the anti-martial law movement and anti-racist and working class movements in the United States. Similar to other leftist formations such as the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, KDP consciously connected movements at home and abroad and organized itself locally, regionally, and nationally towards a long-term long -term goal of socialist revolution. Additionally, KDP sought to free their homeland from U.S. imperialist control, and they took direct instruction from the Philippine left and they also created new centers of progressive Filipinos in the United States. With its first chapters in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, and New York, and it expanded uh, thereafter. Um, KDP brought together over 300 immigrants and second generation Filipinos who became the representatives of the resistance movement in the Philippines in the United States and the vanguard of progress progressive Filipinos in the U.S. And furthermore, while, just to emphasize again, while Katie's P politics were similar to many U.S. activists, their context was unique because of the relationship between the United States and the Philippines, the colonial and neo-colonial relationship. Despite formal independence in 1946, Philippine presidents welcomed U.S. counterinsurgency operations, economic aid, and of course, the military bases. And during the Marcos era, U.S. military aid doubled from $80.8 million to $166 million in the first three years of martial law. So Filipino-American activism was necessarily diasporic because of the U.S.'s role in propping up Marcos through military and economic aid. So KDP's role in the community was uniting uh, second-generation Filipino-Americans and recently arrived immigrants through a diasporic framework of activism. According to their founding Congress, KDP established what they called a dual line, which they describe here. They say, quote, the Katipunan will have two general political tasks. One, to mobilize militant support for the National Democratic Revolution in the Philippines, and two, participate in building the U.S. working class struggle for socialism. KDP's dual line was a hybrid of leftist politics across national borders. Second generation Filipino Americans became radicalized as part of the 1960s youth counterculture and through a broader community of radicals of color. And many Filipino immigrants were involved in the National Democratic Movement, a, democ a democracy movement with a socialist perspective that sought to overthrow the three root problems of Philippine society, imperialism, bureaucratic capitalism, and feudalism. The National Democratic Movement posited that the Philippines is not yet a genuine democracy despite being independent on paper, and martial law was proof of this argument. KDP brought these experiences together and therefore tested the revolutionary potential of the Filipino diaspora and tested the extent to which Filipino Americans had a stake in the future of Philippine democracy. And so for me, I think the political development of its membership um, and their diverse backgrounds and individual stories of radicalization are some of the most interesting parts of studying Filipino transnational activism. And I will highlight one oral history uh, that shows how uh, the second generation connected to the homeland despite never setting foot there. So I'll look at one person. Um, her name is Catherine Taktakin, and she is a former executive director, director of the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and she was a leader in KDP. Uh, she was born to a Filipino father and white mother in Salinas, California, 
and through EOP, she was able to enroll at UC Santa Cruz. There she interacted with anti-war activists and she took uh, the first ethnic studies classes uh, on campus. And she enrolled in college in the academic year of 1968-1969, a year many historians would consider a turning point for social movements. So 1968 saw the formation of the Third World Liberation Front at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley, and integral to their demands for a third world college. Students were um, cultivating their internationalism and their critiques of US imperialism, especially the Vietnam War. And on both campuses, Filipino Americans helped founded Third World Studies, which is now called Ethnic Studies. And they brought their own critiques of the Vietnam War by connecting their activism to protests against US bases in the Philippines and growing unrest with uh, the Marcos uh, administration who supported US interventions throughout Southeast Asia. So in this climate of activism, many young Filipino students like um, Tak Takin developed their understanding of the Philippines. And I have a kind of a long quote here, but um, I'll read it for you. Um, in my interview uh, with her, um, I asked um, kind of how she got to learn about the Philippines and her introduction to learning about her, home, her homeland. And she said, I'd already been attracted to progressive and left politics, but also the exposure to the anti-war movement, the war in Vietnam, I think for a lot of Filipino Americans was an identity point because of the proximity of the Philippines and the role of the bases used in the aggression in Vietnam. For me, it was interesting to learn about the Philippines itself for Filipino American activists because of the way racism works. You begin to think of your homeland, not as the US, but as another country. Uh, and you really have an identification with the Philippines, although I had never set foot there at the time and I didn't know much about it. So here we see what Dr. Rodriguez talked about in her introduction. We see how Filipino Americans conceptualize their identity and politics beyond the US nation state and revealing, this reveals how exposure to local activism influenced Filipino Americans to explore their ties to the Philippines. Um, Tak Taki learned how to analyze and discuss racism through her ethnic studies classes and coupled with student activism, she developed a diasporic political identity. Other Filipino Americans in KDP also connected their lived experience to the neo-colonial condition of their homeland. Um, some were members of, or some people were children of farm workers who were of course recruited here as cheap colonial labor for agribusiness. Other members had family in the US military or were the or were themselves drafted in the Vietnam War, and others integrated with student activists in the Philippines. And some Filipino Americans even caught the attention of the Marcos government and they were put on a blacklist, meaning if they ever traveled to the Philippines during martial law, they would get arrested. And Tak Takin and many second generation Fil Filipino Americans were on this blacklist um, and therefore couldn't travel back home until martial law was lifted. So KDP had hundreds of members and its sphere of influence reached hundreds more. And even though their organization ended after the toppling of the Marcos regime, uh, the transnational radicalism of Filipino American youth and students can still be seen today in organizations such as Anak Bayan and League of Filipino Students. Um, I myself started out um, as an activist in Anak Bayan. Um, and you can see the transnational radicalism today in their protests against uh, Rodrigo Duterte. So as Dr. Rodriguez explained in um, the introduction, many scholars emphasize the politics, the transnational politics of immigrants, but we should pay more attention to the transnational lives of the second generation. Because of the complex history between the Philippines and the United States, Filipino Americans are an illuminating case study to understand diasporic identity and diasporic radicalism. And looking at activism and KDP, we see their connections to the Philippines was not merely romantic or idealistic, but rather rooted in the history, politics, and material conditions of the Philippines. And finally, many activists who are part of the anti-Marcos struggle, not just KDP, but broadly the movement remain involved in their community in various ways, showing that the histories of the 1960s and 70s have an important legacy and they are still relevant to understanding social movements today. Thank you. Thank you so much, 
joy. Um, next on deck is uh, Mark Sanchez. Mark? Hello, um, a real pleasure to be in this virtual space with you all. My name is Mark Sanchez. Um, I currently teach in history and literature at Harvard University. I teach classes on Asian American studies and human rights here. Um, sorry, I don't have slides, so, uh, but um, I guess before That's I started- That's okay, Mark. Perfectly <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> before I start, I, I just want to kind of underscore that a, a big part of the story of this book is the work of forging community and forging a space for scholars like myself that, um, and, and, and Robin was such a huge, huge and amazing part of that. And I am uh, eternally grateful to, um, for her, for, for her guidance throughout this whole process and to be in the company of some, some of these amazing scholars that are in the other pages of the book. Um, so um, when I started writing this chapter, um, I, I, I was guided by a few questions. There were, there were some questions that I really wanted to explore. I wanted to kind of understand how people opposed the government of Ferdinand Marcos and how they did that from the United States. Um, I wanted to take a look at opposition to the Marcos government that took place in areas where there were not a lot of Filipinos. So places outside of the West Coast. In the case of this chapter, it's actually primarily Boston that I focus on. And I wanted to understand how did folks in the 1970s and 1980s come to understand what it meant to be Filipino American. Um, as many people have kind of shared, this story is also, it's scholarly, but it's also personal. I wanted to figure out the conditions of my own parents' migration to the United States. They came in the late 70s and early, early 80s. And what I learned very early on is that Ferdinand Marcos and his government created the policies that actively encouraged and facilitated the export of labor um, and that the export of that labor to places like the United States. So I became really interested in figuring out who this Marcos was, who this guy was, what his government did. But more importantly, I, I was always drawn to how people fought against him. So when I started working on this chapter, I wanted to work with a really confined set of sources to really dive into something. And the, the sources that I used was um, a very short-lived publication called the Philippines Information Bulletin. This was a bulletin that was published for only a few years. If you're interested in it, you can find it in a lot of, um, a lot of libraries that are available online now. It was published from 1973 to 1976. It was ac actually, I think, started by Filipinos, but then eventually passed on to folks that were working in solidarity with Filipinos. Um, the, it, was, uh, it was a ragtag group of folks. They ran the, the publication through a church basement in Boston that they were not actually supposed to be in. And they, you know, they would print, thing, uh, print the issues and distribute it um, throughout Boston and actually mail it throughout the United States. The main actors in my story were Filipino Americans that moved to Boston in the early 1970s. A lot of them actually were KDP members, uh, who, uh, which Joy just talked about. Um, a lot of them were uh, KDP members based in, um, based in the San Francisco, in the Seattle area, and they moved to Boston actually to pursue a master's degree in Philippine studies. This is a really cool part of the story, something that is a story for another day, but uh, for, the, for a while in the 1970s, you could actually get a master's degree in Philippine studies, and it was at this small school in Boston that was like an alternative anti-imperialist feminist school where like a handful of students would come every year to get degrees in Philippine studies to hopefully teach Philippine studies in campuses throughout the United States. So this all relates to you know the the ethnic studies strikes and the movements of like the uh, late uh, of 1968 and into the 1970s. Um, so the activists that I, I, I look at came to Boston, and you know you can imagine I, I grew up in Southern California. Like these are like folks that are used to the warm weather, and they they have to get used to winters in Boston. 
and it was really tough. And you know, Boston uh, didn't have uh, didn't have a lot of um, was not particularly seen as a city that was very kind to people of color. So it was a challenge for them, right? And uh, but what they did was they got really involved in in their local politics in Boston in things that were going on ar around immigrant communities here in Boston, as well as um, working, ag working against Marcos in the Philippines. So I found, I went through all of the pages of the bulletin, I read through everything, and I found really amazing examples of Filipino Americans trying to figure out what it meant to be Filipino American. Um, I found examples of um, authors, uh, like authors uh, writing editorials that were, um, criticizing uh, new books on Philippine studies and the authors of those books writing back to these uh, these graduate students and them having debates on the page in the pages of the bulletin. I found examples of Filipino Americans really working to learn about the issue of political detention, something that is going on in the Philippines today, but was going on back then too. And they were learning about political detention and writing about it and trying to um, trying to bring in the rest of the, their community into being aware of human rights abuses. I saw Filipino Americans publishing stories from amazing Filipino American authors like Bulasan alongside, um, alongside, you know, a lot of, a lot of amazing folks in, uh, that were writing from the Philippines, right? Like people like Amado Hernandez, people like Clarita Roja, who, um, uh, was the pen was the pen name for an amazing poet named Mila Aguilar, right? Like, I, they and they would work through these kinds of short stories and poems and try to under uh, come to an understand uh, come to an understanding of what it meant for their identity. I also saw uh, an issue that was um, that was published by a group of activists that had spent um, that had spent a couple of years um, sneaking into the World Bank during holidays to, to take, uh, to, 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 to sneak out documents from the World Bank to learn uh, and report on the systematic underdevelopment of the Philippines, right? And these were the, the things that showed up on the, on, on the pages of the bulletin. So I, I saw so much amazing stuff about, uh, about these people trying to figure out uh, what it meant to be an activist and what it meant to be a Filipino American. Uh, the, sort of conclusions that I reached or um, that I drew out is that, you know, there were many sites of opposition to martial law. And, you know, um, as we saw in the, in the map that, that, that Joy put up there, there were activist groups in the Midwest, in the East Coast, throughout Canada, el elsewhere in North America, in Western Europe, um, throughout the Asia Pacific. There were so many people all over the world working in solidarity with, uh, with Filipinos against Marcos. I also learned that Filipino Americans really were participating in a transnational circuit. They were exchanging letters and uh, with underground activists in the Philippines, debating tactics with them and figuring out um, what it would mean to be an activist, what would it mean to, um, to work against Marcos. And ultimately what I realized is that this bulletin, this small newspaper that you know, barely anyone remembers, is a space where people were trying to figure out identity. And for many of the folks that I was, um, that I was looking at, this meant working on issues in the Philippines, but also working for improving rights for Filipinos in the United States. Um, I'll stop there. Um, Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanchez. And I believe um, Dr. Rodriguez had to unfortunately leave, but I'll just be taking over as a facilitator for the panel. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move forward next with our next speaker, which is Professor Karen Buenavisa Hanna. So, Karen, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Wayne. I'm so appreciative of Professor Rodriguez and the Bulo San Center, as well as your work. Wayne and putting us together today. I echo the sentiments of Mark um, around the pleasure and, um, and gratitude for being able to work together with all of these emerging scholars um, and to be supported in this way by Professor Rodriguez. Um, 
I am an assistant professor in gender, sexuality, and intersectionality studies at Connecticut College. I'd like to give a shout out to Marissa and Jaffet, my students who are here today and uh, really excited to be taking this course with Professor Rodriguez. Uh, I also want to honor the Lenape people whose land I call you from today, um, otherwise known as Brooklyn, New York, um, and also call on my ancestors who carry me now and every day. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um. Okay. Can you all see? Yep, we can see it. Yep. Okay, perfect. So the title of my chapter is Center Women in the Fourth Shift, Hidden Figures of Transnational Filipino Activism in Los Angeles, 1972 to 1992. Um, you know, this chapter is really as laying much of the groundwork for transnational Filipino activism in LA and beyond. Um, and I'm not just highlighting women because they're often missing from historical narratives. I'm really highlighting them because of their invisible labor that I argue pushed forward overlapping movements. Uh, I draw on sociologist Arlie Hochschild's work on emotional labor to define in that are routinely erased and devalued in society. Um, and that's because they are racialized, classed, and gendered. Uh, I knew I wanted to focus on invisible labor, labor in my research uh, because prior to Heading into graduate school, I didn't know that I wanted to do my PhD. I was an organizer um, and I saw the labor of women and LGBT people routinely erased from our work. Um, and we recognized that our work was so important too. Um, so you'll, you wanna um, look at this picture that is on the screen. This photograph is from Agbayani Village in Delano, California. Um, this is Uh, which hopefully you've learned about already, who were the Filipino farm workers who migrated from the Philippines to the US and were highly exploited, but as well were masterful labor leaders. Um, the two women that I feature in this chapter were part of numerous delegations of young Filipinos who went to help build the village for their elders in the 1970s. Um, so this was taken around 1975. And the two women that I focus on in this chapter are in this photograph. Um, Esther Soriano is third from the right on the bottom. Um, she spearheaded this delegation. And Prasia Barca's de la Cruz is third from the left on the bottom as well. So you can see that this delegation wasn't a specifically a women's delegation. It was one that was mixed gender. Um, and so I, I highlight that because the transnational activism that uh, was so prolific um, in the 1970s and 80s and continues to now um, is, mixed, is, is mixed gender, right? It's not, um, there are women's groups, but a lot of the work um, are, are co-ed um, and, um, and they're not specifically directed, you know, towards sort of women's issue, uh, issues. And so, I want to highlight the um, theory of historian Maylie Blackwell, who writes about what she calls multiple feminist in her work on the Chicano movement, that uh, if we only understand feminist access happening within women's and LGBT organizations, we, just, we miss the multiple struggles that happen within movements and how people worked in and between them. So what my chapter does is it recognizes the multiple feminist insurgencies into activist groups that were transnational, they were multiracial, they were mixed gender, and uh, first and second generation Filipinos worked together within them. So the first was a multiracial theory building group in LA that started meeting in 1975 called the Sunday Morning Group. Um, it was based in LA. And then the second was a US-based 
anti-imperialist formation called Alliance for Philippine Concerns. Um, shorthand, it was called APC. It worked in solidarity with the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines. Um, it had chapters all around the country. Um, and after Marcos was overthrown in 1986, it continued to mobilize people to um, spread the word that the U.S. was maintaining a presence in the Philippines. Right, the U.S. imperialism um, continued even without a dictator there. The indigenous method of storytelling to share um, some of the multiple feminist insurgencies of Esther and Prossy with you. And so I'm going to start with Sunday Morning Group and Esther Soriano Hewitt. Um, Esther Soriano Hewitt was a second generation American board film. Filipina. She was born in Santa Paula, California to Filipino migrant farm workers. And by the time the Sunday Morning Group was formed, Est was already well respected in LA's Filipino community. She was a co-founder of the first national organization of Filipinos in the US against martial law called the National Committee for Restoration of Civil Liberties in the Philippines. Um, it was also known as NCRCLP and it was founded on the day that martial law was declared in um, September 22nd, 1972. So while the NCRCLP chapter is all dissolved and were replaced by the KDP, which was an organization that Joy talked about, um, Soriano was part of a group that strategically chose to maintain a chapter of the NCRCLP NLA. They chose to do this because they recognized that a broad base would help round out support from those who might find the KDP too radical. So now comes the chismis. Now the late Don Mabalan called history chismis with footnotes. Um, and it's, it's so true, right? We really don't know the full history, the hidden figures, the humanity of movement history without these details that um, come up in our conversations, right, on the side, but aren't always in the leaflets, aren't always in the history textbooks. So um, by 1974, Esther was dating a man named Ray. Um, Ray would later become her husband. Ray is the third. Um, Esther connected him to Enrique de la Cruz, a Filipino immigrant and recent doctoral graduate from UCLA, who she worked with in NCRCLP LA. Now Enrique was looking for a roommate too. And so he moves into Ray's house where they lived with a third roommate named Bobby for almost three years. Now, Ray Masai Hewitt and Bobby Bowens were, uh, were former members of the Black Panther Party. Ray wasn't just any member of the Panthers either. He'd been its Minister of Education for three years in the Bay Area. So it was Ray who proposed forming a study group after learning it was so important from his experiences in the Panthers. And so the Sunday Morning Group um, emerged in 1975. It met for three years in these three people's Victoria Park home in LA. Um, its members read and discussed theories, including Karl Marx, Lenin, Mao, and other radical thinkers. Um, they brought these ideas back into their own grassroots political organizations like the NCRCLP. Enrique recalled the group was made of white working class folks, a carpenter, a couple of teachers, African Americans, Latinos, and Filipinos. Enrique de la Cruz remembered that uh, Ray Hewitt encouraged a multi-ethnic composition so that members could learn from progressive struggles everywhere, including the U.S. fight against racism, um, the Philippines, Nicaragua, as well as Palestine. Um, the group met rigorously. They studied hard and they met every Sunday for about uh, four years. So the Sunday morning group's style was very different from the Black Panthers. Um, the Black Panthers used uh, what was called democratic centralism. And it was supposed to be, you know, democratic, but because of um, sort of a, a method of efficiency, um, sometimes tended to be quite top down. And so according to Prossy, the democratic tone of the Sunday morning group came from Esther. Now, I couldn't ask Esther where she got this demo uh, democratic method from um, because she has already passed away. 
Um, so it's difficult to know. She had a long history of civil rights activism. Um, but I want to really lift up what she, what she did because it's um, something that um, various scholars in the Black Power Movement, um, Black Freedom Struggles have also explored in um, challenging top-down hierarchical and charismatic leadership models that make the labor that women undergo invisible. Um, Karen Sachs is a scholar who um, termed the word center woman to describe the key actors who mobilize networks and consciousness. So for Sachs, leadership resides in the interaction of spokesmen and center women. And so I would add that center women like Esther paid attention to the needs of others, recognized interpersonal links, forged connections. And she did that by linking Ray and Enrique's roommates. And without that link, their version of the study group may never have existed. Um, her invisible labor also included instituting this democratic structure, which was really new to many members of the group. And it was very inclusive and built on the leadership sk um, skills for everyone and particularly women. Um, so, you know, SMG was short lived, but Esther's democratic initiatives lived on and they were carried into Filipino solidarity groups into the next decade, including APC, which Prossi was also a part of. Now, Prossi Barca's de la Cruz moved to LA at the age of 18 in 1972. She was no stranger to radical politics by the time she joined NCRCLP and SM and uh, the Sunday Morning Group. Um, she was a longtime activist already in the Philippines by the time her parents forced her to move to the US because they were afraid for her life. Um, so when she uh, was a part of APC in the 80s, she had already been decades deep into organizing. Um, her invisible labor, she uh, talked about organizational sexism from her male comrades. To help us if you want us involved. Imagine three meetings in one weekend, three organizations meeting, and guess who would uh, clean the bathroom? The wives. So my activist woman friends would help me clean up, and the guys essentially got trained to help us. And, um, and there was another struggle too, an evolution of character, an evolution of aligning what they're saying progressively with their, what would they're doing. So you can see here that Prossy is an example of what Gramsci calls an organic intellectual. She's very conscious and vocal about her invisible labor. She um, points out that there were various shifts that she was undergoing. Um, you know, she was working outside of the home. She was doing this reproductive labor in the home, taking care of her kids, doing domestic work at home, doing the activism, and then also doing this labor for the movement itself. And so developing the emotional labor or the emotional processes of her male comrades um, is something that actually like women of color are talking about a lot more today, particularly black women and about the labor that we tend to carry for men of color um, and cis men of color in particular and helping them quote, undo the patriarchy and process their emotions. Um, so, you know, I tell these stories because I wanna, I wanna reveal them, Esther and Prossi, as just two of the many hidden figures of transnational activism in Philam history. They were leaders of their own, um, but they also made their, their groups evolve. Um, and so I, I just want to like, I just want to end by saying that um, I want to contextualize this in our current pandemic. Um, the pandemic is exposing gendered and racialized invisible labor and care work. 52% of essential workers in the US are women, 77% of healthcare workers in the world are women, Filipinos are four times more likely of any immigrant group in the US to be healthcare workers. So you can see that you know, we are living these statistics right now in a very grave way, but what's exciting is that people are really starting to see the labor that has been rendered invisible all along. 
So I want to leave us on a question. How can we honor Esther and Prosti and people like them by not just lifting up their transnational labor, but by actually restructuring the labor in our homes and in our communities so it doesn't just fall on women or poor people of color all the time as it has done historically. And I really urge you to get involved with your local communities to address that question. And I really look forward to doing that work along many, alongside many of you. Um, and, and I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have hopefully in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Benedict. I really appreciate that. Uh, we keep uh, things moving along. I know it's a co-authorship, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and actually pass it along to my co-author, Dr. Michael Castaneda, uh, to speak on your chapter. Uh, so go ahead, Dr. Castaneda. I'll go ahead and let you take on the shared screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to just reiterate everything the the authors have been saying in terms of you know the role Robin uh, Rodriguez brought in terms of bringing us together. Uh, it's a really honor to be able to kind of share this history because, uh, you know, from my uh, my work in terms of, you know, interviewing a lot of KDP activists, the one thing that they'd say is it's a responsibility of, of the movement to share movement history. So it uh, just gives me another opportunity to kind of honor the political work that they've done. Um, so for the sake of time, I think I'm, I'm just going to read... Uh, just so I could stay on time and we could get into um, Q and A's that everyone wants to get into. So Wayne, my chapter of the book focused on the revolutionary lives of Sylmi Domingo and Jean Vierman. So who were Sylmi and Jean? They were labor activists in the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen Union Local 37, a Filipino led union that represented canning work in the Alaska seafood industry. Um, but they were also members of, of the KDP. So it was precisely their ability to link the struggles of Filipinos across the Pacific that ultimately led to the US funded Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship to order their murders. In fact, in 11 days, it'll be the 39th anniversary of Sylmi and Jean's murders in uh, June 1st. So as Wayne and I approached the article, we wanted to address the question of whether Sylmi and Jean offered us, you know, as scholar activists, as students of social movements, as Filipino Americans, uh, a usable history of resistance, right? Uh, but for the purpose of the presentation, particularly, you know, I've been thinking about the fact that we're, this, the virtual space we're in is an ethnic studies class, right? You know, so um, I'm gonna veer a little bit away from the argument of the paper and think about the legacy of Somi and Jean, not solely as activists that were part of transnational social movements, but also to think of them as products of the movements for ethnic studies. Uh, and here I'm particularly thinking about, um, you know, the work of um, Fred Moten, a Black Studies scholar, who makes this distinction between Black Studies as this kind of institutionalized space and Black study, which is something that's, that's not rooted in the university. It's actually constrained by the university, right? And something that, you know, we could think of that happens um, in the places we labor, in our homes, in our communities, um, and even might happen in the classroom, right? And it's kind of a space of, of collective study that happens when we're, we're together and we try to think about the situations that we're in and, and um, you know, try to think about social change, right? So in the time that I've left, you know, I wanted to discuss how research and study shape the development of Somi and Jean as radical internationalists. So in class, you probably learned about the Civil World Strikes at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies. Uh, Sylmi and Jean were part of similar student struggles at the University of Washington and Yakima Valley Community College, respectively. Historian Robin Kelly reminds us that a defining feature of this early period of ethnic studies was its relationship to the community and community-based struggles. So for Filipino-American students of this period, struggles for housing and workers' rights were not simply things to study, but they functioned as alternative classrooms where students had the opportunity to learn from some of the most vulnerable members of their community. Uh, and when they went into their community, they found activists. So from this perspective, we could understand Alaska salmon canneries as one of those spaces of community-based learning. So much like Filipino American youth of the 1960s and 1970s, um, even prior to being involved in student activism, Somi and Jean worked in Alaska salmon canneries in their late teens. Despite this being a time of intense civil rights struggles, um, you know, they found that the canneries existed as a civil rights movement never happened. 
you know, so what I mean by this is you had a dual union system that tracked white workers into the highest paid positions within the, in, within the industry as fishermen, mechanics, and supervisors, while non-white workers were locked into low wage and hazardous labor where they cleaned, butchered, and, and canned salmon. Where white workers were lived in a newly renovated bunkhouses, Filipinos and other workers of color were subjected to substandard housing that hadn't been renovated for 30 or 40 plus years. And on top of this, the union that represented them, the ILW Local 37, which had a rich history of militant labor activism, um, had grown deeply conservative by the 1960s. So this was the result of anti-communist hysteria in the 1950s that pushed many of the politically principled labor activists within the union uh, out of it. Yet it was kind of in the context of community-based uh, learning that ethnic studies encouraged, you know, that allowed uh, Sylvia and Jean to, uh, to link their, their studies to problems in their community. And particularly as Sylvia and Jean got active in um, the struggle to save uh, Seattle's Chinatown International District, from displacement that was coming with the building of a kingdom, kingdom stadium. They found a lot of the, the labor radicals of the 1950s that were pushed out of their union. So for the sake of time, I won't go too much into this, but, um, but one of those labor activists they found was Chris Monsalves. So Chris was widely acknowledged as one of the most important Filipino labor organizers along the West Coast from the 1930s to the 1950s. Sylvia and Jean would find that Chris kept many of the flyers and reports from his days as an organizer. So one of the documents that Chris shared with Sylvia and Jean was the ILW Local 37's 1952 yearbook. So an important context um, to this yearbook is that not only affirmed, um, context is um, union leaders uh, were facing deportation for being labeled communists, and in this context, they not only affirmed their right to fight for economic justice in the United States, but they also published a series of articles that expressed solidarity with workers of the Philippines, even publishing articles written by Filipino labor activists like Armando Hernandez. Armando Hernandez. So when I interviewed those close to Silmi and Jean, they reminded me that the yearbook was not only a place where Silmi and Jean discovered their history, but they also, also discovered their future. And what I mean is that they were able to understand the historical conditions and political conditions that shaped the exploitive conditions they experienced in Alaska. But they also found inspiration for their union could be, one that boldly stood for the economic rights of union members, but also worked to build meaningful relationships with workers around the world and Filipinos in particular. So I think uh, another lesson is, um, is that their transnational activism was grounded in a study of US imperialism. So as members of the KDP, Somi and Jean made a point to refer to the repressive government of Ferdinand Marcos as the US Marcos regime. The key point is that the US aid, as, um, as Joy, Joy explained, as well as loans from the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, um, you know, is what propped up the Marcos regime and without it, it crumbled, right? So KDP activists understood that Marcos' repressive stance and organized labor, such as outlawing the use of strikes, was a means to protect the interests of transnational corporations in the Philippines. Uh, so this understanding of global capitalism was central to Sylmi and Jean's efforts to follow in the footsteps of past Filipino labor radicals like Monsalves and build meaningful relationships with labor activists in the Philippines. You know, as Silmi's older brother, Namicio Domingo, would, would mention to me in an interview, said what was common about Alaska, that was common in Hawaii, that was common in the Philippines, is that they were all working for U.S. corporations. And I want to stress that research actually helped clarify this point, right? Uh, it, was, it was one transnational corporation in particular that links the struggle of Filipinos in Alaska, Hawaii, and the Philippines, Castle and Cook Incorporated. So when I searched through the personal files of, of Gene, you know, I found extensive collections of documents on the operations of this corporation. And a two-page report he wrote and he circulated to fellow KDP activists within the Canary Union. While Gene was an avid student of history uh, and politics, his study was part of a larger political approach taken by the KDP, which paired research with ideological training. 
So each KVP chapter had its own program of political education, which was complemented by an ideological institute held during the KDP's national conference held every two years, where KDP members studied Marxist political uh, philosophy and also applied it to their various campaigns. So as Gene applied this approach to the study of Castle and Cook Incorporated, he closely assessed the corporation's global operations, which included plants in Alaska, Hawaii, Honduras, Costa Rica, and the Philippines. Moreover, he took extensive notes on the company's operations in Mindanao, the southernmost island of the Philippines. In a dole banana plantation in Mindanao, Gene noted, workers received 1.31 pesos per hour which at the time was equivalent to 18 US cents per hour, and were forced to build shacks on rented land at the plantation's management and staff lived on beautifully landscaped and maintained houses protected by armored guards, right? And he couldn't help but think about the relationship uh, to labor that he found in Alaska. Not necessarily saying it was the same, but he saw all these different parallels from the racialization of space, um, racial hierarchies on the workplace. Um, and uh, so in March and April of 1981, Gene supplemented his research through traveling to the Philippines and meeting in person leaders of the Kilosong Mayo Uno, or KMU, Confederation of Anti-Marco Slavery Unions, whose collective membership included 500,000 workers. So Gene's research and travel served as a basis for a resolution he and Silmi passed at the International Meeting of the ILW in May of 1981, which condemned the labor policies of the U.S. Marcos regime and made a call for the Philippines to be the next designation for the next foreign delegation of the ILW. So in a matter of weeks, both Silmi and Jean were gunned down in their own union hall. Right. So just to kind of close, um, you know, I would just want to share uh, three words um, that captured, I think, the legacy of Silmi and Jean. Love, study, and struggle. So love, Silmi and Jean were tragically, tragically taken too early. I'd be happy to talk about the different political forces that were involved in their murders, but I'd rather focus on their lives and their deep love they all, that they had for all oppressed people and their deep revolutionary commitments for Filipino workers scattered across the globe. Study, I think, um, you know, a key lesson, particularly for us as ethnic studies, um, you know, scholars and students is, you know, Jean and Silmi were products of what we call the first wave of ethnic studies that were produced during the radical movements of the 1960s and 1970s. And they understood that research and reading were tools that activists can harness in the fight for social justice. Right, lastly, struggle, Silmi and Jean were taken from us precisely because they're committed themselves to the struggle of oppressed people and Filipino workers in particular. All right, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Dr. Castaneda. Uh, we keep on uh, rolling through the presenters. Next up is Professor Ryan Liano. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, of course, uh, I thank my esteemed colleagues and of course, uh, Dr. Robin Rodriguez for bringing us all uh, together on this um, particular project and this uh, presentation on um, it's been a labor of love, right? Um, so I'm Dr. Ryan Liano. I'm a professor at um, Cal State University Fullerton. Um, I teach as a as a uh, full-time lecturer in the Asian American Studies Department. Um, so I've been doing that for about uh, going into my sixth year. Um, uh, and I'm going to present um, my chapter uh, which uh, again is a labor of love uh, that began um, late 2009 and uh, culminated in 2000, around 2014, and was able to capture it in you know the essence of my um, of my work in this particular chapter in our anthology. So I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. Um, if I could share the screen, I'm pretty sure I can. Um, Y'all see that? Yep, you're all good. All right, cool. Um, so my particular chapter is called, um, damn, I don't know why I'm so extra. Um, Artist as Citizen, uh, Transnational Cultural Work in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines. Um, so that's just a um, picture of uh, one of the um, worldwide um, 
protests known as uh, People's uh, State of the Nation Address, where we would come together as activists and as community members to um, offer and address what the real situation is um, in our homeland, um, the Philippines. So um, I take this title, uh, or, in, or inspiration from this, of this title of this uh, chapter of my work uh, from the late great um, uh, Filipino filmmaker, Lino Braca, um, who's quoted as saying the artist is a committed person, um, that he will always take the side of any human being who is being violated, abused, oppressed, dehumanized, um, using whatever instrument, the pen, the brush, or the camera. Um, and so I start off with that um, in that in the National Democratic Movement, which is actually transnational in scope, um, cultural work, or um, the simplest way of describing it is using art and literature for the purpose of changing culture, of shifting culture um, for positive change, right? Uh, again, that's just a simple um, description of it. Um, so going into it, um, yeah, how have um, activists and community organizers in the Philippines and both also here in the United States um, use our respective um, uh, forms of art to really uh, shift the culture and change the culture and really expose and oppose what's happening um, with our people, um, both in the Philippines and for um, the Filipino community abroad. So I'm going into this as, um, you know, with my, with my particular experience of being um, an artist of being a cultural worker um, and it started um, you know a little bit before I started my uh, master's at San Francisco State University in Asian American Studies and I really wanted to um, capture what I was already doing as an artist um, so um, y'all can go ahead and laugh if you want but this is pictures from my early dance days as a professional hip-hop dancer um, from um, early 2000s. So that's a picture of me with um, a few of the original members of the Jabberwockies. So, um, and around that time, and I, it's argue, arguable even to this very day that um, the hip hop dance community is primarily, or I shouldn't say primarily, is um, a significant population happens to be Filipino American. And so um, I wanted to take that into, um, uh, my scholarly work, um, drawing from my experiences in the Filipino American community and especially in the hip hop dance community. Um, and, you know, at one point also pursuing a career in hip hop dance, but um, um, fortunately it took me to uh, where I'm at right now, right? Um, but yeah, it was coming from that experience of doing um, hip hop dance shows, um, dance battles, breaking battles and all that. I even landed a couple of gigs um, for, um, you know, for uh, mainstream artists, right? You know, pop artists. I would go to auditions and I would, you know, like submit, you know, stupid headshots like this, right? <laughs> um, and um, uh, but what got me, um, I guess, on this particular road where I'm at now is that, like, um, around the time that I was, uh, you know, pursuing a career in hip hop dance, I was also finishing up my um, undergrad at Cal State Fullerton in ethnic studies. And um, what I was um, really um, into at the time and still am to this very day is um, knowing that a lot of our stories and our histories is actually left out of the curriculum, right? And so I wanted to, I, I decided to put my hip hop career on hold um, and eventually retire from it to you know pursue this uh, career in um, education. So, um, and in that, um, road to education, um, pursuing my master's degree in Asian American studies at SF State and eventually going for my um, doctorate degree at University of San Francisco in international multicultural education. Um, I also became, you know, a community org organizer and activist. And one of the things that I um, learned was um, to be able to bring our creativity into the movement. Right, to be able to bring our um, artistic abilities and use that for social change um, in the movement. And so the last picture I'm going to show was from 2012, where um, this was, I guess, one of the most um, agitating times of my life as an activist. Um, this was at the anti-NATO and anti-G8 summit in Chicago, um, where a bunch of us um, converged in the city of Chicago to um, really address what was going on in terms of the G8 summit and the NATO summit. And 
um, my fellow activists have asked me to choreograph a, a flash mob as, you know, as a way to protest that. And so that's us um, over there. Uh, I was able to choreograph a simple, you know, dance piece um, that addresses, you know, the problems that the G8 was unleashing uh, throughout the entire world. Um, and if you notice really right there, like um, a little bit to my right is actually Dr. Robin Rodriguez. So um, yeah, um, so how our lives have converged, um, not just in academia, but also in our, um, in our mass work in the community as activists. Right? And so um, I share that because this is a, a lot of uh, my work in terms of um, transnational cultural work in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines um, comes from my own experiences. Right? And so um, this study um, or this inspiration of this topic um, comes from my own experiences as a transnational cultural worker in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines. And um, going into this, research has been done on Filipinos in the arts and social movements, but however, there is a paucity of information concerning uh, Filipino cultural work. So cultural workers define themselves as creating culture as an act of resistance to imperialism, as much of the stories they tell through their creative work is not revealed much in mainstream media. Um, cultural workers are not just um, artists, but more importantly, we are community organizers who are of and with the communities and in many ways are the popular educators and organic intellectuals of our communities. And one of the objectives of getting into this um, is to examine uh, the extent as to which uh, cultural work brings political consciousness to marginalized communities um, who don't have access um, to education. Another objective is to examine the impact of cultural work locally and transnationally as a tool for social change and addressing issues that marginalize populations, particularly in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, um, a social movement that goes beyond the borders of the Philippines. And so what is cultural work? Um, and this comes out of uh, my experience, again, stemming from 2009 to about 2014, where I would go back and forth between here in the United States and to the Philippines um, integrating with several communities in the Philippines and as well as here in the United States that do cultural work. Um, and this is what I gathered, you know, from my fellow cultural workers in the Philippines and over here, is that cultural work is defined as a tactic in organizing populations that have been marginalized and oppressed, exposing and opposing its injustices and building a movement that creates a culture of resistance. And for cultural workers, art is informed by the culture, by the struggles of the communities they are integrated in. And through cultural work, marginalized and oppressed communities are awakened to political consciousness, organized to address social problems, and mobilized to build a movement for social change. And for cultural workers, um, they define um, themselves as creating culture as an act of resistance to imperialist culture, as um, my colleagues have mentioned in their, um, um, in their presentations. Uh, cultural workers are not just artists, but more, more importantly, are community organizers who are of and with the communities. And like I said, in many ways, are the popular educators and organic intellectuals of the communities who don't necessarily have um, access to education or the easiest access to education. Um, it is also the patriotic duty of cultural workers as citizens of society to transcend the establishments and organize communities into social, social action. And coming out of that, um, this um, years of um, you know, integrating with the uh, communities and also doing cultural work uh, as part of my integration with these communities, you know, ranging from the urban poor in the Philippines to, this, um, you know, the, to the squatter areas, for lack of a better description, in the Philippines, and as well as to the far-flung far areas um, in the provinces, um, especially in Mindanao during my time with the, um, the Lumad communities the indigenous communities over there um, in conducting this um, gathering of stories and uh, research on cultural work in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, they were able to share with me um, decades long lessons on the important role of cultural work in social movements and what are the tasks of cultural workers in, um, in our movement. Um, so just um, among them is to expose and oppose exploitation and oppression um, celebrate the exploited and oppressed masses as the true heroes slash heroines and creators of history, and to repudiate um, bourgeois leaders and so-called hero, so heroes, um, 
to provide the correct history um, of our people. Um, further tasks of cultural workers is to provide education on cultural work, um, conti continuously study culture as um, culture is always changing, uh, society is always changing, expose the truth and oppose counter-revolutionary culture, create and disseminate pro-people arts and literature that is um, really rooted in the experiences and lived truths of um, uh, vulnerable communities and to invigorate mass critique, you know, as opposed to traditional artists who work in isolation and are, you know, um, stereotypically, I'm not saying this as a blanket statement, but sp stereotypically um, are very sensitive, uh, cultural workers actually invite um, mass critique because that the, the work is, the art that they produce is informed by the communities. And so it's their responsibility to invite mass critique from the communities that they are producing their art from. Um, so further task is to conduct uh, skills training in all disciplines, develop cultural activists, or organize cultural workers, network with other writers, artists, and intellectuals. Now the basic uh, principles that they shared with me, um, again, this is coming out of decades long of so lessons uh, to draw from. The first question is always for who? Who is it for? Who is this art that you're creating for? And the, the simple answer is for the people, for the masses. Anything that you do, anything that you create should be informed by the experiences and struggles and aspirations of the masses. Right? Unity in form and content. Um, a lot of times, especially in this day and age, um, a lot of art is out there where there's not a very strong unity of form and content. You might have the dopest piece, you might have the most elaborate, aesthetically pleasing piece, but the content kind of flies over your head. And on the flip side, there might be some really good content out there, but the delivery or the form of delivery in getting that content out there might not necessarily be the best. And again, it flies over people's heads. So um, always the task or the principle of um, uniting those two things, form and content. Um, political and artistic criteria, okay. Um, as many of us have studied, there is no such thing as a political art or neutral art. Right. Um, everything is political. Everything has an interpretation that can be applied to social change. Okay. Popularization and raising of standards. Okay. And of course, um, taking uh, from our indigenous past, um, lessons from our indigenous past, traditions from our indigenous past, but also um, couple it with the reality that we're living in. We're living in um, an age where there is so many um, foreign influences, but to take the best of those foreign influences um, and apply that into the art that we create, into the cultural work um, that we create. Okay. Um, now as, um, just to summarize all of this in terms of my work um, in this particular chapter, um, again, inspired by the, um, the work of Lino Bracca, famous Filipino, Filipino um, uh, filmmaker, on what it means to be a cultural worker, right? And um, I'm just re reiterating, reiterating the quote uh, in the beginning. And um, as stated throughout this study, um, cultural workers create culture as an act of resistance, as stories they tell through their creative work are not revealed so much in mainstream media. Um, and as shared by the participants in the study, I, I was able to integrate and, you know, really chop it up with um, culture workers in the Philippines. Um, I was able to include four in this study, and as well as uh, Filipino American culture workers here in the United States. About um, four of them um, are featured in the ch in my chapter. Um, their main role is organizer. It's not artist. Um, art, their art becomes um, secondary because their role as organizer and taking the struggles and aspirations of the people that they organize with therefore informs their art. Right? Um, and again, in many ways, um, cultural workers are the popular educators and organic intellectuals of their communities. And um, also the participants, oh, the participants um, of this work um, all confirmed um, the assumptions that I um, off offered when I began this of the three overarching theories of this study um, through their experiences as cultural workers in this movement. 
Um, the organizing through cultural work is in essence the social practice of Augusta Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Um, okay, Augusta Boal is a contemporary of uh, Paulo Freire, um, who is um, the father of critical pedagogy, um, and in many ways the father, of, uh, the you know, the forefather of ethnic studies. And um, Augusta Boal argued that um, theater is basically a rehearsal for revolution, right? So how do we use theater? How do we use art to really change um, our situation? of our communities for the better, right? Um, cultural workers in their role as critical organic catalyst, which is a concept coined by Cornell West, um, they exemplify their practice of being the artist, uh, teacher, organizer, and researcher, or in the Philippines, they call it ATOR, right? A-T-O-R, with their communities uh, they align themselves with. And then lastly, the cultural workers um, that I was able to integrate with uh, described and identified with the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines closely as a social movement with a distinct social process of transnational um, collective action. Right, so I will end this um, with just reflections on when I um, uh, began this and, um, and in many ways still continuing uh, this work in terms of um, cultural work in, the, in our movement, right? Um, this is the mural that was shown earlier today of the, um, the Filipino American mural at uh, SF State. Um, we stand on their shoulders, right? Um, taking, again, this is exemplifying like cultural work, but in a, in a way that's transnational, right? Both um, addressing what's going on in the Philippines, but also what's happening here with our um, uh, Filipino American community. Um, so that I'm just going to perform a little spoken word <laughs> so much, somewhat, right? So there are still so many stories to tell and so many valuable lessons to learn. In all my experiences with fellow cultural workers over the years and connecting them to my research that no amount of research can fully capture the comprehensive experience of the transnational cultural work in the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines. That comprehensive experience can only be captured by immersing yourself in the community. But there's one thing that I can say about my journey as a scholar activist and as a cultural worker in this movement, I can sum it up in one word, love. Love in the midst of all the hard work and all the anger and rage against this imperialist machine that is channeled creative, creatively through our cultural work and all the joy and laughter, I cannot help but fall in love, fall in love with the people. I, I have fallen in love with the work that drives this movement. And most especially, and most importantly, I have fell, fallen in love with the people, both my fellow activists and the people we serve. It was their passion, their creativity, their humility, and their love for the people that have melted my heart for over the, over the years. All these experiences have made me into the cultural worker I am today, fully embracing the role of ator, artist, teacher, organizer, researcher. As an artist, I simply create. Um, and encourage the creativity and harnessing of my fellow artists. As a teacher, I'm a popular educator and organic intellectual, intellectual who teaches the history and culture of our people in order to understand the root causes of our current experiences and issues, and in turn, encourage the people to also become popular educators and organic intellectuals in their communities. And then as an organizer, I work and participate in campaigns that address social injustices faced not just by Filipinos, but all, um, but all people, personally, locally, and globally. And then lastly, as a researcher, I work alongside and integrate with marginalized communities facing these injustices. Who are the real experts of these injustices? We're not, you know, like, and I'm pretty sure my fellow colleagues can agree, we're not the experts, it's the people themselves who are experiencing these injustices, who are the real experts, right? And a lot of our work really comes from them. Um, again, they're the ones who are experiencing these things firsthand. And these are things, these things uh, encompass who I am and which inspired me to create my own acronym um, in addition to um, ATOR, um, of what it means to be a cultural worker, which is um, triple C or three C's, conscious, committed, and creative. So I'll end it there. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thanks so much, Professor Liano. So we want to make time for our last presenter, Dr. Joyce Mariano, and go ahead and let you take it on. And I know folks may have to leave by four, but we want to make sure we give you as much time as you need. Uh, so folks need to trickle out by four is totally fine. Uh, but go ahead, Dr. Mariano. All right. Um, 
Thanks, Wayne. Uh, I'm honored, I'm really honored to be part of this group that Robin Rodriguez assembled. Um, and thanks, Wayne, for helping organize. We've chatted on the phone before, but it's nice to meet you. Um, my chapter in the book analyzes literature. So I've never really written about novels before, but I'm getting more and more excited and interested in the idea of how cultural production, like novels, defy our expectations, how cultural work offers alternatives to dominant narratives and how they can express the subtle um, and buried forces and layers of meaning that are always present but can be outside of our reach when we're talking about daily lives or social structures. Uh, my chapter in the book analyzes two novels by this guy named R. Zamora Lindmark. I don't know if any of you have read his work, but he's a Filipino, he's a little bit older than I am. He was born in the Philippines, moved to Honolulu for at least part of his schooling. Um, can't remember if he moved in middle school or high school, but he currently lives in both Manila and Honolulu, bouncing back and forth, at least when it's not a global pandemic. Um, my chapter has two parts. Part one examines dominant narratives that give shape to what it means to be a quote, good Filipino in America, at least according to American national culture and state policies and capitalist demands. And this first part analyzes um, Lindmark's novel called Rolling the R's, which is about this really, this group of really irrever irreverent Filipino fifth graders living in Honolulu in the late 1970s. Um, maybe some of you have read this book. And then the second novel I look at is another one by Lindmark. It's called Leche. Leche takes one of the characters from the first novel named Vicente or Vince, but then fast forwards over a decade and explores a week in Vince's life as he flies back to the Philippines and experiences Manila for the first time as an adult. Um, the second part of the chapter builds a claim that in addition to narratives that give shape to what it means to be a good Filipino American, there are also dominant narratives that give shape to what it means to be a quote, good Filipino in diaspora. So Lindmark's novels help us to recognize the forces, histories, and hierarchies that are at play in those dominant narratives offering alternative ways to navigate community and belonging. Um, so given the other topics and, the, and speakers that we've already heard from, it's worth noting that Lindmark does this in part through the insertion of martial law in narrating family and migration histories and spaces both in Honolulu and Manila. So, um, you know, that's pretty much the point of my chapter. So, I don't really have time to get into the into um, my reading of the novels, but I'll say more about what guides my analysis or engagement with these books. So um, some of it has already been addressed by Robin Rodriguez and others, but I'll just say it in a way that's relevant to my chapter. Um, my analytical lens contends with development and developmentalism. My chapter, unlike the other contributions, isn't um, directly about activism, but it has implications relevant to transnational activism. So the colonization of the Philippines by the US and American standards of assimilation are development projects that construct undeveloped subjects and spaces in relationship to subjects and spaces that are developed and productive. And, so, and as such, it becomes the right, um, if not the duty, of those subjects that are developed and productive to name, locate, study, and police the subjects and spaces that are not. Um, this, however, leads to a condition for racialized subjects, including Filipino Americans, which is inherently contradictory. So we can see this contradiction in the ways 
that Filipino labor has been recruited as cheap labor, despised as threat, policed for demanding justice, and then alternately celebrated for its flexibility for its flexibility and willingness to move wherever it can fulfill a need. Uh, the promises of uplift and progress of American developmentalist projects, including colonialism and assimilation, cannot be reconciled with the uneven effects of American nationalism, histories of imperialism, and transnational capitalism that work to control, monitor, and discipline racialized subjects. Um, developmentalist progress narratives provide an alibi or a cover for colonialism and dominant nationalisms because the attention is on the underdeveloped subjects and spaces and how they need to be controlled and monitored and disciplined. So erased are the social, political, and economic forces that create and reproduce those conditions and that maintain the fantasy of development and faith in development projects. So, you know, it's important that we critique developmentalist progress narratives when talking about colonialism, assimilationist ideology, and labor migration. And um, my work in general has been about how developmentalist progress narratives also give meaning to Filipino diaspora. Um, kind of, you know, basically the problem is when we just focus on diaspora as a fact, as a description of Filipinos who are dispersed from the Philippine homeland, or when we celebrate diasporic, diasporic returns. Um, the problem is, is that, is when we erase the colonial histories and neo-colonial and political economic forces that spur and guide global migrations and that underwrite um, the reproduction of the Philippines and Filipinos as undeveloped. So in its place, celebrations of diasporic returns can flourish when those things are erased. Um, dominant narratives produce, quote, good Filipinos and good diasporic returns. And these come with material implications and consequences. Um, by diasporic returns, I mean embodied returns, such as when Filipinos overseas return to visit or live in the Philippines. Um, I'm referring to economic returns, such as with remitt remittances. And I'm also referring to other kinds of uh, symbolic or imagined returns, such as in the support of charitable or social development projects in the Philippines. Um, so to put it in kind of anecdotal observations, in terms of an anecdotal observation, you know, I've heard grumblings and I've read a bunch of critiques of Filipino balakbayans or returnees who, when visiting the Philippines, um, can expect, sometimes in subtle ways, they can expect deference or special acknowledgement for the fact that they, quote, made it in America. So what plays out is this kind of romanticized return. So kind of like, um, yes, I might have left the Philippines, but I have returned. I've remained a Filipino in my heart. And now that I return as an American citizen and the envy of others, or therefore the envy of others, my sacrifices are worthwhile and my journey is now complete. So that's the kind of romanticized diasporic return. Um, expanding on this and what I've written about in other places, not in this chapter, um, is how it, it feels so important that Filipino Americans give back to the Philippines to show that they remain Filipino and that it's important to quote, you know, just give. And this is on, is on just to give. People can pat themselves on the back because they've accepted the call to just give, you know, whether it's donating to typhoon relief or to feed hungry Filipinos. However, you know, my whole point is that if we're just patting ourselves on the back, we're not working to understand how, for example, extractive neo-colonial practices have left the Philippines more vulnerable to natural disasters than other spaces. We're not working to understand how poverty is reproduced in the global South. Um, we are not working to understand how celebrations of American citizenship are always constructed in relationship to devalued Filipinos elsewhere. So anyway, um, 
turning to the novels by Arzamora Lindmark in my chapter, um, I explore alternatives to conventional narratives of celebratory spaces and diasporic returns. Um, so enrolling the R's, I'll just very, just really briefly. So what's interesting to me about the fifth graders, it's about this group of irreverent, I say irreverent fifth graders in Honolulu. What's interesting about them is that they understand that there are all these different institutions and entities that have standards for what it means to be good Filipino American subjects. So these fifth graders understand how they are located within and by these institutions. So they're from working class Filipino fa excuse me, families in a place that already assumes that all Filipinos are gardeners or janitors and you know, dog eaters. They know how these assumptions guide how teachers and classmates treat them and their communities. Um, some of the characters are immigrants and some of them speak pidgin, making them a target of teachers and the proper, you know, the so-called proper rules of English and their teachers equate pigeon with unruliness, if not an inability to learn and therefore undeserving of their time as educators. Uh, their struggles, desires, and choices show, so in the book, it, they show that they understand the norms and what it means to be marked as potentially deviant subjects of the nation whose tendencies must be overcome. However, instead of erasing the racialized logics and neo-colonial and political economic forces that create these conditions of Filipino-American subjectivity, Lindmark, Arzamora Lindmark, in his novels, works to make those forces visible. Because of this, the characters, their desires for belonging, um, do not translate to a desire to simply be, quote, good Filipino American subjects. Instead, in his novels, we can see their struggles, desires, and choices as problematizing dominant American and diasporic narratives of belonging. Um, so reading these novels, these two novels together, um, I make an argument about uh, Lindmark's denunciation of conventional narratives of triumphant and celebratory diasporic returns. I think that's all I have. I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Joyce Mariano, this is Amelia. I teach at um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, in American Studies. Uh, I teach Filipino, um, American, Philippine X Studies and Asian American Studies. Awesome, thanks so much, Dr. Mariano. I know we went a couple minutes over time, so everyone, thank you so much for hanging on with us. Uh, to respect the speaker's time and the student's time, then no class is ended. Um, we're, we're unfortunately not going to be able to have Q&A, but uh, we're going to go ahead and ask all the presenters if they're okay with uh, an email being shared uh, at a later time to the attendees. So if, if you all have any further questions about their work, their chapters, their uh, trajectories as scholars, as activists, as uh, just community leaders all, all itself, uh, we'd love to kind of build that community and have y'all uh, continue that conversation there. But with that further said, I just want to say thank you again for all the co-panelists uh, uh, in terms of sharing your work, sharing your time and energy, and speaking to its power in terms of your, your work uh, in itself. Um, and we're excited to continue the conversation in the future. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, we're going to have this recording shared for folks who came late. Uh, so that way folks could uh, vibe back and, and listen and, and learn again. But again, thanks everybody for being here. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to stick around and I'll be able to uh, answer any other questions about getting involved in the future. But thanks everybody. Thanks to all the panelists. Appreciate your time.